Welcome to the Raising Boys and Girls podcast. I'm Sissy Goff. I'm David Thomas. And I'm Melissa Trevathan. And we are so glad you've set aside a few minutes to spend with us today. In each episode of this podcast, we'll share some of what we're learning in the work we do with kids and families on a daily basis at Daystar Counseling in Nashville, Tennessee. Our goal is to help you care for the kids in your life with a little more understanding, a little more practical help, and a whole lot of hope. So pull up a chair and join us on this journey from our little yellow house to yours. David, we see a lot of unique kids in our offices. And if it's one thing I've learned in all the years I've done this, it's that there is no such thing as one size fits all when it comes to education. That is the truth. And it's why I'm so excited about Ethos School, an online Christian school. Ethos understands the responsibility parents feel to ensure their child develops academically, socially, and spiritually. And you know that holistic approach is music to our ears. Ethos partners with parents to shape their children as whole people, offering over 100 relational, high-quality online courses for 4th through 12th grade students. They have multiple world language, math, dual credit, and advanced placement options. They also offer weekly time with a live teacher and classmates, which is so important for a child's educational experience. Ethos's online teachers are expert educators, and each one either has or is currently pursuing a graduate degree. No wonder their advanced placement scores soar above national averages. Right now, Ethos School is offering to waive the $95 enrollment fee for our podcast listeners, plus a complimentary academic counseling session to plan your child's academic journey. Visit ethoschool.org slash RBG or click the link in our show notes to take advantage of the waived enrollment fee offer and to plan your child's educational journey with an Ethos academic counselor. That's ethoschool.org slash RBG. Visit today. John Acuff is the New York Times bestselling author of seven books, including his most recent soundtracks, The Surprising Solution to Overthinking, and your new playlist, The Student's Guide to Tapping into the Superpower of Mindset. Published in more than 20 languages, his work is both critically acclaimed and adored by readers. When he's not writing, Acuff can be found on a stage as one of Inc.'s top 100 leadership speakers. He's spoken to hundreds of thousands of people at conferences, colleges, and companies around the world, including FedEx, Nissan, Microsoft, Chick-fil-A, and Comedy Central. For over 20 years, he's also helped some of the biggest brands tell their story, including the Home Depot, Bose, and Staples. His fresh perspective on life has given him the opportunity to write for Reader's Digest, Fast Company, the Harvard Business Review, and Time Magazine. John lives outside of Nashville, Tennessee with his wife, Jenny, and two teenage daughters. John, it is so much fun to have you here. I'm yes, looking forward it to is. it. So yeah, it's fun. Gonna be a blast. Our paths intersected through mutual friends like years ago. So this yeah. feels like this has been a long time coming. Well, and, and I quoted you in one of my books. I like was, I shared a story. <laughs> yeah. I was so this honored. is my honor to get to do this because mm-hmm. I've been quoting you for years at this point. <laughs> you are so kind. Mm-hmm. We're assuming probably most all our folks know you, but for any of our listeners who don't, will you just tell folks a little bit about what you sure. do, and about your family also. Yeah, sure. Um, my name is John Acuff. I live right down the street in Franklin, Tennessee. We've lived here nearly 13 years, um, which has been really fun. I grew up in Massachusetts. My family moved up there when I was six, so my formative years were in New England. I went to Sanford University, majored in journalism, which is really where I fell in love with writing and creating ideas that can move people to action. Um, Mm -hmm. I started a blog that did well, and then I got to publish a book out of that, and then it moved us to Nashville, and I've run my own company for the last 10 years, and I spend my time every year doing two things, writing books and then talking to people about those books. And then I have two uh, teenage daughters, and Jenny and I have been married for 22 years this April. Wow. So yeah, that's a pretty succinct. Congratulations. Yeah. Yeah. There we go. John, your best-selling book, Soundtracks, released not long ago. Talk about the need you saw to write a new book to make that message accessible for students. I wrote this book about mindset. 
because my favorite thing to do is to simplify complicated topics. Mindset is a complicated topic. It's fuzzy. It's holistic. There's so much nonsense about it. Mm. And so I thought, how can I change the way I think? And I learned some things about thinking that it changed my life. And whenever I come up with a new idea, I look for three things. I look for a personal connection. I'm going to talk about this for years. I better Mm. be personally heart level connected Mm -hmm. to it. Two, do people need it? Is there Mm -hmm. a need in the community? Am I hearing people talk about it online, at audiences, when I talk to companies? And the third is, is there a place for me in the marketplace? Or has it already been done? So I always joke that if you have, you know, a great passion and there's a spot for you in the market, nobody's serving it, but nobody needs it, that's a hobby. Like, I love that you're into ferrets, but that's not, there's not a huge, like, that's great. You're yes. into albino ferrets. Yes. Nobody needs that. If you have a great passion and people need it, but it's already overserved in the marketplace, that's a cake pop. Mm. If you told me today, I got this crazy idea, I'm going to sell cake pops. I'd be like, Ugh. <laughs> Starbucks already has that. Like, by the time it's at Starbucks, it's too late, dude. Right. And then if you have, something that people need and there's a spot for you in the marketplace, but you're not connected on a heart level, you Mm. just created a day job. Mm. Like it might be successful, but you're not going to be excited about it. So with overthinking, I'm an overthinker. So I'd done it for years. So I had a deep personal connection and going, I think if I change my thoughts, it'll change my life. We asked 10,000 people, um, this PhD named Mike Peasley, who's a professor here at MTSU, we asked 10,000 people if they struggle with overthinking, 99.5% of them said yes. Wow. So huge need. And this is before wow. 2020. The pandemic was catnip for overthinking. Mm. And then um, I went to the marketplace and I was surprised how many people would say, just stop it, stop it, stop it, turn off mm. your thoughts. And one, that's impossible. Call it quiet time, meditation, yoga, whatever. That's 30 minutes of your day. What about the other 23 and a half hours? Mm -hmm. And then two, we're designed to think. We're the only species that can think and change. Like every blue jay has built the same exact nest as every other blue jay. There's Mm -hmm. never been a blue jay that said, you know what? I think I'm going to do a ranch. You know what? I think I'm going to do a tall and skinny in 12 South and knock down something historic (laughs) and put like 19 houses in this one piece of land. Like that, every Blue Jay does the same thing that every other Blue Jay does, but humans have the ability to think and change and grow. So once I knew I had those three factors, it's kind of my Venn diagram for a successful idea, then I'm willing to spend hours and weeks and years leaning into it. That was Soundtracks. And then your new playlist for teenagers came out of that. I love it. What about kids made you want to write it? What about kids and where they are today? Well, I, it was my seventh book, and I'd never had parents ask me for a teen version. So I'd never had parents say, hey, you wrote this book about finishing. Do you have a version for teenagers? You wrote this book about career transitions. So parents started to ask for it and mm-hmm. go, hey, if I could have learned how to change how I think about myself as a teenager, would it change the whole arc of my life? I mean, you know that, like when you bump a kid with truth, it changes the entire arc of their Mm -hmm. life where you bump a 42 year old, they've already traveled a lot of life. It changes their life, but it's just a different scale. And so that was the big thing as parents asked for. The second thing was I started to notice broken soundtracks in teenagers. Mm -hmm. So uh, we were at a swim meet uh, once and this girl got out of the pool and said to her mom, I'm the slowest swimmer on the team. I'll never get better. Um, I'm the worst. And she walked away and my wife and I just said, oh, those are just broken soundtracks. She can change that. So Mm. any parent listening, absolutes are usually a broken soundtrack. So Mm. I'm the only one that doesn't have the new iPhone. I'll never get better at geometry. Everyone got invited to the party but me. So I started to see them. And then the kicker was 10 years ago, I spoke at a bunch of youth camps. I look at youth camps as like the testing ground for public speakers if you want a hard audience to motivate, oh. it's it's teenagers at a beach camp. Woo. None of them are there for the speaker. None right. of them are there like, I just want to take notes and grow. <laughs> like, that's what I'm here. Like, they want to see people in bathing suits. Yeah. <laughs> and so I spoke at a bunch of youth camps and I would ask them to write down their thoughts about themselves mm. on cards and turn them in anonymously. And that box sat on my shelf for a decade. And then it was like, as I got ready to write this project and work on it with my kids, I realized, wait a second. I have thousands of real soundtracks from thousands of real teenagers from across the world. And we laid them all out and we could see patterns and real need. Like the number one word that appeared on more cards than the other was the word enough. Mm. I'm not pretty enough, smart enough, popular enough, mm. tall enough, skinny enough. And mm. so we, it just felt like this perfect storm. And then I had two teenage daughters that could write the book because if I wrote it, it would sound like an adult trying to sound young, like, hello, fellow youth. Like, <laughs> what? Don't crease the J's. Like, I'm so lit. Oh, I'm savage. Like, it would sound whacker than whack. So it just <laughs> felt like we had a perfect situation to create what I felt like was a real need. Yeah. Mm. 
What was it like riding with them? What was that whole experience? Oh, it's like hilarious. It was hilarious. I mean, it was kind of introducing them to my world. So it was mm-hmm. like the ultimate bring your daughter to work day. Yeah. The way we structured it was I would kind of create an outline and say, here's what we're talking about. Make it real. I could guess at what pressures they have, but they know the pressures they have. They know the pressures their friends have. And it was so it ended up being a learning experience for me too, because there were times where I'd go, here's what people want to know. And they go, we don't want to know that, dad. Like mm. we either already know that, we don't care about that. Here's this other thing you're not even thinking about. And so we would do that. So I'd go, hey, what are the 10 pressures you guys face? And they'd come up with a bunch. And we'd kind of talk through that. Or I'd go, hey, what are the questions you hear at the lunch table? Okay. And then, so we would do it on a broad level. And then we'd get down to the micro where the stories feel real because they are real. So like an example of that in your new playlist, there's an example of, and it's a two sentence example, but it's the texture of examples that give a book kind of breathing room and make it 3D. So the example is that maybe one of your friends that you sat at lunch with posted a thank you post on Instagram and included everybody but you. Mm-hmm. And that happened to a girl that my daughters are friends with. So they sit at a six person round table and one Thanksgiving, one of the girls did a thank you slideshow on Instagram yeah. and mentioned everybody but one person. Welcome and the to one what we talk about in my knew. office all the time. Yeah, yeah. The one person knew. And sure. so like that, I couldn't have imagined that because I don't live in that. Mm-hmm. But when my kids, when I sent them out to go like, what's really going on? They're able to say like, here's what's really going on. So that's what the writing process was like. It was a lot of give and take. It was a lot of them telling me that joke's not funny. They were like, we're not doing any dad jokes. The worst dad joke I had in there that they were like, I thought they were going to throw up. (laughs) I was talking about your principle, David, the dial that, Mm -hmm. you know, dials. It's not a switch where you try to find one thing that changes you forever. Life's a dial. When the stress gets loud, you dial it down. And so I said, it was a header even. I said, no offense to Harry Styles, but dials have more than one direction. And they were like, (laughs) Oh, dad. <laughs> like, but I was like, it's so oh, clever. So good. And they, so I, part of their role, I thought of them as hockey goalies, just blocking pucks, and the pucks were my dad jokes. That's that is awesome. Yeah. What a yeah. cool connecting experience for the three mm-hmm. of you two to have had yeah. forever. Yeah. And we get to talk about it. So we'll do book signings. Yeah. We get to, and so it's been interesting to see them process it see them, be excited about it. I'm glad we did it. And the response has been bigger than we thought it'd be. My long-term hope is that mindset gets taught in schools. Mm. 20 years ago, our plan for kids with finances was, here's a credit card, good luck. And then when we would repair them at 38. And now freshmen, sophomore have personal finance classes. And Mm -hmm. I think that's amazing. So I would love to see, I mean, we've had principals buy 200 copies and teachers buy 50 copies to have a freshman class on here's how mindset impacts what you do. Because we, like, if you think about it, like somebody said this to me once that we ask kids to be braver than we are. Mm -hmm. And by that, I mean, we bring them to a soccer field and go, hey, you see that group of kids you've never met over there and that adult, that's now a sport you play, run out there. Mm. Or, and then when as an adult, like if my wife goes, we're going to a dinner party, I'm like, for how long? Who's going to be there? Do they have a dog I can pet? Mm. What's the dinner? Like, I don't want, I don't put myself in uncomfortable positions, Mm. but imagine like every kid gets a new boss every year in the form Mm. of their teacher. They get a new job every year. No adult does that. No adult does 12 years in a row of a completely different job. And if they did, they'd have a panic attack constantly. Mm, But kids, we go, you go be really brave. I'm going to structure my world so that I don't have any means or need to be brave. And then Mm. we wonder why kids are stressed. And so it was really fun to be able to jump into a kid conversation and have parents have an extra tool that they can use. Oh, I love that. I love that. One of the other things that we love in the book is that you encourage kids to ask three questions when they're overthinking. Oh, yeah. Will you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so I call these Trojan horse questions because they're simple. The words aren't impressive. Everybody uses these words. But if you'll sit with them, there's deep truth hidden inside them. And so the first question is, is it true? Is the thing I'm telling myself about myself true? Well, I think one of the greatest mistakes you can make is assuming all your thoughts are true. And the reason we do that is because every thought you have is delivered in the voice you've heard the most, which is your own. Mm -hmm. And the problem is we never go back and confront a thought that's lied to us. So a thought says, hey, that friend, that sophomore is so mad at you. They're so mad at you, so mad at you. You interact with them and they've already forgotten the thing you thought they were mad about. You never go back to your thought and go, hey, you got me on this one. You got me. You made me lose sleep. I, was, I didn't eat breakfast or lunch. I hid out in the library because I was so stressed. 
but you weren't accurate. So the next time you tell me something, I'm not going to believe you. So we never do that. We never call our thoughts on the carpet. Mm. So the first question is, is it true? Second question is, is it helpful? Is it helpful? So when I tell myself this again and again, does it push me forward or pull me back? And the example I love from the book, my youngest daughter, McCray, failed a test. She failed a test in biology. And the next time she had a test, a month later, the night before the test, she was telling herself, you could fail again, you could fail again. You failed last time, you failed last time, failed last time. And is it true she failed the first test? It is true. Is it helpful for her to tell herself that a hundred times a night before the test? Of course not. There are some things in life that are true, but not helpful. Mm. And so we were able to say to her, if a friend texted you a hundred times the night before a test and said, remember you failed the last one, remember you failed the last one, would that be a good friend or a monster? And Mm. she's like, that would be a monster. Exactly. So don't talk to yourself that way. And then the third question is, is it kind? Mm. Am I being kind to myself right now? Would I talk to a friend this way? Would I let somebody talk to me this way? So it's, is it true? Is it helpful? Is it kind? And if you can't say yes to all three of those things, it's usually a broken soundtrack. Mm, That's so good. So rich. Yeah, true, helpful, kind. Yes, it is. John, in this season of the podcast, we're focusing on raising emotionally strong and worry-free kids. Mm -hmm. And just would love to ask you, what's a story or a favorite memory from growing up that shaped you into who you are? Well, I mean, one part of the reason I'm a writer, we're talking about books, is I had a third grade teacher, Mrs. Harris, at Doyon Elementary School in Ipswich, Massachusetts, laminate a book of poems I'd written. And it made me feel like a writer. And she didn't do that and go, I think 20 years from now, you'll write a book, 30 years from now, you'll write a book. But that act of like, wow, this matters. This is something I like, I see that there could be something here. So that was one that really, that was a positive reinforcement of here's a thing that off, especially when you're third grade, fourth grade, like writing isn't a thing that's celebrated, like sports are celebrated or other thing, other more tangible things are celebrated. So for her to go, Hey, here's something that's a little unusual, a little unique. I think it matters. I think you might think it matters. You know, and it wasn't she gave me this long speech. It wasn't like this long moment, but it's still something that, you know, 40 years later, I'm like, oh, that was really helpful to me. So that's one that easily comes to mind. I love that. Mm -hmm. I love that. And I want every teacher listening right now Mm -hmm. to just camp out in that story. Oh, yeah. So to teachers, what I what I tell teachers is the challenge of teaching is you usually don't get to see the conclusion of the song. Mm -hmm. When you're a teacher, you get to be one verse. And that's really hard. You get to be one chorus. And you don't know that the thing you planted is going to, you know, have another verse added in college and another verse added when they're 32 and another verse added when they're 34 and 40. Like, And so as a teacher, you have to hold on to that because we enjoy seeing results. And often in teaching, you don't get to see the results in the same way. Because a third grader or fourth grader, eighth grader never goes... Hey, I really appreciate the foundation you're laying in my life right now. This is doing me a lot of good. And I I can't wait to build on this when I'm a young man in my mid-20s. Thank you for being the first cornerstone. They never say that, Mm -hmm. but that's what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's to me, part of the tension of of being a teacher. Mm -hmm. So good. Mm -hmm. David, did you know that typical children's vitamins are basically candy in disguise? Filled with two teaspoons of sugar, unhealthy chemicals, and other gummy junk growing kids should never eat? That's why Haya was created, the pediatrician-approved, super-powered, chewable vitamin. Sissy, what's the age cut off on those vitamins? Why do you ask? I have a friend who wanted to give them to their son who's in his 50s. Do you think that would be okay? <laughs> David, have you been eating the children's vitamins? Maybe. (laughs) I get it. There is a reason kids like them. They taste great and they're pediatrician approved. I haven't seen my pediatrician in a few decades, but I feel (laughs) sure he would approve of me having them. Haya is designed for kids of all ages and sent straight to your door. So parents have one less thing to worry about. Formulated with the help of nutritional experts, Haya is pressed with a blend of 12 organic fruits and veggies then supercharged with 15 essential vitamins and minerals, including vitamin D, B12, C, zinc, folate, and many others to to help support immunity, energy, brain function, mood, concentration, teeth, bones, and more. They send you a bottle with your first order, and Henry loved decorating the bottle with the fun stickers. I decorated my bottle, too. (laughs) 
We've worked out a special deal with Haya for their best-selling children's vitamin. Receive 50% off your first order. To claim this deal, you must go to HayaHealth.com slash RBG. This deal is not available on their regular website. Go to H-I-Y-A-H-E-A-L-T-H dot com slash RBG and get your kids the full body nourishment they need to grow into healthy adults. Okay, so your girls, say again how old they are. McCray is a 17-year-old junior in high school, and Ellie is a 19-year-old college freshman. Okay, so they're on the older end of things. Yeah, uh uh-huh. So thinking about them growing up, what are some things you would say help them become emotionally strong and or worry-free? I remember um, a soundtrack that was helpful for me was we were at Burt's Pumpkin Patch, this big pumpkin patch outside of Atlanta, and... um, Ellie was probably four, and she jumped in a puddle as we were leaving, and she got wet. And I totally overacted as a parent. Overreacted like she had jumped into a pile of lava. And this older man there, probably like a grandpa, said, it's just a puddle, son. It's just a puddle. Mm. And so that soundtrack of there's more things in life that are just a puddle than you know as a parent. So Mm. going, okay, how do I not overreact to this? It's Mm. just a puddle. That was one of the things that I think for me as a parent helped me parent them with less pressure. Other things that we talked about. So like we have little things that we, we do with the girls where like, we'll say, put your shoes on first. So, and that's a really tactical, practical thing where we don't want the kids to come to the car carrying their shoes. So if they've got five things they have to do to get ready, but they'd rather be on their phone, we would love you to be on your phone. Just be on it pressure-free. Put your shoes on first, do the things, and then have 15 minutes of just enjoying your phone versus you spend 20 minutes on your phone and then you're scrambling and stressed out leaving the house. So it's a Mm -hmm. super practical, like, and I do it all the time now. Like if I have something to do, I go, what's the thing? Like, what are the shoes in this situation? Oh, Mm -hmm. this is the first thing I need to do Uh so that I can enjoy the rest of it. Like I'm going to put my shoes on, do all that, and then I can enjoy it. And Mm -hmm. so we would do little things like that. My wife is a, is a great mom, is, is super smart. And so she was really deliberate about vacations we did, um, about moments we had, whether it was camping. We didn't have a lot of money. And the great thing about parenting when you don't have money is your kids don't know. They have no idea. And so like, we always joke, like, have your kids early because you're already going to be poor. Throw them, add them in the mix. <laughs> like, it's just so like, we would do camping because it was $11. We right. would do botanical gardens. We really tried to find fun ways that weren't expensive to be part of our to our family. And then the, the last thing I'd say, which this was, Jenny taught me this, my wife Jenny. So I, uh, my business travel went from zero days to like 70 when I started to speak for a living. Wow. And I felt a lot of guilt about that. And I would do this long goodbye to my kids and be like, I'm leaving, like, please light a candle in the window, like until I get home. Like, and Jenny finally pulled me aside and said, they don't even know to be sad. You're teaching them to be sad because they're Mm going to mirror your emotions, mirror neurons, and you're giving them your shame and your guilt, and then you leave. So they're happy right now. They have no concept of time. So when you say, I'll be home in four sleeps, that means nothing. And you're stirring them up and getting them anxious, and then you leave. And you're demonizing work. So you spend 18 years telling Mm -hmm. kids, work's miserable, it's taking me away from you. And then we're surprised they don't want a job at 22. Like you spent 18 years demonizing work and then of course they don't want a job. So she said, when you leave, we want it to be a celebration. Like we're not mad at you. You're reading into that. You're adding that, not me. We're not mad at you. We're excited you're doing your job. You're following your purpose. I want my daughters to see what that looks like. And then when we get to do something fun, let's connect it to the hard work you did. So when we get to go to Disney, six months later, say, hey, remember that thing I missed because I was in Oklahoma City? That's connected to this. That mm. work I did is connected to our ability to do this, okay. and it's all tied together. And so like when you say, so then I started to say, I don't have room for shame in my suitcase. Like, I don't have room for shame in my suitcase. Like, as I do a business trip, and there's so many moms that have to work, dads mm-hmm. that are traveling, moms that are traveling, whatever, and they're like, oh, I'm the worst. I'm the, like, and you just, you just create this drama moment for your, you add anxiety and ask your kids to hold your guilt versus going, hey, I have a job. I'm going to go do it to the best of my abilities. I love being with you. Both things are true. I'll see you in a little while. Like, yeah. it's a completely different setup. Mm, that's so good. I was thinking that we, we could stop right there, yeah. but we're not going to. <laughs> yeah, okay? that's funny. That's Rich, funny. 
We'd love to also ask you, what is something, thinking back on the early years mm-hmm. of parenting, that you worried about, that you look back now and think, I wish I hadn't spent so much time worrying about that? Well, I mean, I, I think to a certain grade, grades, like, mm. especially like, you should never be stressed for it with a second grader's grades. They're not even really doing much yet. They're doing important foundational things, but like going like, is this a minus? Is this a plus? Like really getting overstressed on grades. The second thing would be their friend networks. I think Mm -hmm. one of the greatest challenges of a parent is you want your kid to have friends. You want them to have heart friends. And like, there's a real pressure about that. So not worrying about your kid's popularity, like Mm -hmm. putting more focus on their heart. And going, okay, like, how do I build character? How do I build heart? Versus going, are they getting asked to enough things? Do they have a good enough friend? I didn't have a friend growing up. And then this one's a little heady, but I'm still kind of in the process of thinking about it. Not trying to fix your problems and your kids. I think it's one of the greatest mistakes parents make where they have a kid who's anxious and they're anxious too. And they try to, it's easier to put that kid and go, you got to fix this because you can control them versus deal with your own stuff. So not trying to like, one of the things I think about a lot is I'm 47. So when I have, you know, 17 year old, 19 year old, I try not to go to them and go, why don't, why are they doing it this way? I don't do it that way. I had 30 extra years of experience. I had a friend say that to me. He said, I'm just frustrated that my 16-year-old doesn't, like he's not on time, he doesn't have his act together. And I said, how long did it take you to get your act together? He said, I was, until I was about 30. I was like, no offense to your parenting. I don't think you shaved off 14 years of experience. <laughs> like maybe, let's call it a year. That's so like good. give him 13 yeah. years of growth, <laughs> dude. And that's, that's, that's hard as a parent. But I think giving them more space to develop into who they are and to learn the lesson Mm. and for me to help them learn the lesson, but not try to rush them to the conclusion of the Mm -hmm. lesson without the experience of the lesson. So those are things I look back on and go, okay, like I wish I'd been more open-handed with that. And I wish I had had better vocabulary for my own feelings. Like Mm. I'm late, I feel like a late bloomer to being the phrase, I feel sad. Like, I feel like, I think a lot of adults have a hard time with that. So I wish that as a younger man at 32, I could have been like, hey, I'm sorry I reacted that way. I was really scared about blank. I didn't know how to say I was really scared. So I think knowing how to express my feelings would have given us deeper, faster connection. Mm. Oh, so many good things already. Okay. Yeah, it's fun. So if you had to think back as you were starting the parenting journey, what's something you wish someone had said to you? What's one statement you wish someone had said? Um... I mean, on a funny level, like kids are more durable than you think physically. Yeah. I remember we <laughs> tipped a guy like crazy at the hospital to install our car seat properly. Like we were so nervous. Mm. And I'm sure he's just like an assistant of something like an admin. And we were like, you're a car seat expert? Okay, you got it. And like, <laughs> we gave him like $20, which was $1,000 to us at the moment because he was like the expert. And now I look back, I'm like, oh my gosh, that's, you know, people told me it goes by fast, but I don't think you should ever tell the parent of a toddler that childhood's fast. Mm. I think childhood as an overall is quick, but dude, the toddler years are slow. Yes. Um, so I, I wish somebody had said to me that. And I wish somebody had said every season is the best season if you look for the best. Mm. So like I love having teenagers. That's I so think good. Every I think season. people demonize adolescence and we self fulfill these prophecies of like oh it's the worst like cuz you'll say I've got a 12 year old oh they're almost going to hate you do they hate you yet like we kind of really so I would have loved to have somebody say hey Toddler's hard, but man, it's the best. Like eight is hard, but man, it's the best. 14 is hard, but man, it's the best. Like, mm. and go like really learn to look for those moments and go, okay, yeah, that was that was really fun. What I did get told by Jeff Henderson, a friend of mine, was that like quantity leads to quality. So that I would say that was a mistake I made early on was like trying to schedule quality time. Being like, okay, we've got an hour, we're going to throw the Frisbee and we're going to really get into some quality time. And boy, do kids shut down, I think, when they can sense that you're trying to check a box or Mm -hmm. you're trying to force a parenting moment or versus throwing the Frisbee 50 times and on time 37, you have a real conversation. And on time 22, like, so that I would have somebody go like, quantity leads to quality, like, and you'll get there. Mm. Mm. John, when you look around you, what do you see other parents or even just other humans struggling with the most? Fear. Mm-hmm. You're like tons of fear. I always say like fear starts um, as an idea. And then if you don't process it, if you don't admit it, if you don't deal with it, it morphs into a belief. And then if you don't 
do something with it then it morphs into an identity and then it's part of, like it's so ingrained so i think fear is really really loud right now for a lot of people mm-hmm. there's a lot of people that don't understand that the odds are stacked against them and what i mean by that so i teach a lot of people about goals and they'll go i feel distracted my kid feels distracted i feel distracted it's hard for me to focus and i'll go well it should be like there's 10,000 of the greatest engineers who have ever lived at companies and their goal is to distract you. Mm. Like Netflix doesn't want you to have a good family. Like Hulu doesn't want you to lose weight. Um, Amazon Prime doesn't want you to write a book. Dating sites don't even want you to get married because then you're no longer a customer. Their goal isn't that you get married and leave the, the app. Of course not. Their goal is you have a hundred useless dates and continue to pay the subscription. <laughs> like so, I think we sometimes. <laughs> Don't take into account that it's challenging now because the distraction industry has scaled faster than our ability to focus. Mm. And so just going, oh, yeah, it is challenging. How do I stack the deck in my favor? What does that look like? Like, where do I make some smart decisions? Where do I? So, and then I think people are isolated. I think there's a lot of people that are really starving for community. I think that if we're not careful, we'll continue to create things that are easier to do, but create isolation. When I go to Good Cup coffee shop here and the woman at the front knows that I always just get a large coffee and she hands me a cup before I even get up there and I ask how her kid's doing. It's only a 30 second interaction. I don't want to exaggerate like we had some moment, but I could have ordered online and picked it up on the side and never interacted with her at all. But then I'm not John, I'm order 483 and there's no interaction. Like Mm. DoorDash killed the two times you'd go into a local restaurant and the man and you got to interact with the manager. Like grocery store delivery killed talking to Peter, the 80-year-old bag boy, because every grocery store has a retiree that came back and he's amazing. Netflix killed Blockbuster, where like you would get a recommendation from somebody who was often a film buff. Like mm, some kid who was so like, true. Oh, you gotta check. I know you've never heard of this one. I know you're here for Teen Wolf, but this one, you know, like there's all these moments and I don't think we've taken to into account like remote working killed accidental lunches where mm. somebody go hey last second we're all going to go over to mm. the taco shop do you want to go with us and relationship developed there mm. there's amazing benefits of technology we're using technology right now so it's not like I'm a ludite like and I'm like ah technology is bad but we haven't replaced all the accidental community we've lost so like what I've been saying lately is like accidental community is over the future is intentional accidental communities over the future is intentional. I think a lot of people are struggling with that right now. Mm. Mm, That's so good. Well, we talk so much about arming ourselves with truth and talk talk about that with kids and families, which is so much of what a soundtrack or a playlist is. You've said some already, but would you say there's like a foundational truth that has helped you worry less as a parent? Well, I mean, one is fear gets a voice, not a vote. So Mm. I don't like when people say, if you do these three things, you'll be fearless. Because I look at fear not as a negative thing. It's it's an early indicating system. Like, and it's often the fastest indicator. Like, it's fa- like fear is faster than hope, in my opinion. Like, it shows up really fast. And so I don't like when people say, if you do these three things, you'll be fearless. Because I think every time you grow, there's some degree of fear, and there should be. So the first time I spoke to 10 people, I had 10 person size fear. But I worked on it. I got over it. I did the speech. Then I spoke to 100 people. I had 100 person size fear. And 1,000 people, 10,000 people. Each level, I had new fear. So I think if you don't have fear, it can often be an indicator you're not growing, you're not changing, you're not challenging yourself. So I like to say fear gets it's a voice. I'm going to listen to it. I'm going to learn from it. I don't think you can have full self-awareness without admitting fears. Mm-hmm. I don't think you get to know about yourself unless you go, I'm afraid of that. Like, why did I say that? Oh, I'm afraid that like, I'm jealous of that person. It's coming out in fear. And I don't, okay, I need to, I need to be smart about that or different about that. So I say fear gets a voice. It doesn't get a vote. It doesn't get to sit at the head of the table and go, we're not doing that. We bang the gavel. So fear gets a voice, not a vote um, is a big one. And then for me, if I take God at his word, that's one of my things is the soundtracks is like, take God at his word. Like the Bible is either true or it's not. So if I believe it's true and I'm told all things work together for the good, then that includes my kids. It's not all things just for John. It's like my family, like the people I I know. And so trusting that God's better at parenting than I am. And that opens up things like where I, like one of my favorite soundtracks around God is that he's the worst negotiator in the world. Because like he gives us, eternal life and I give him my junk. That's a terrible Mm. trade. Like God is the worst negotiator. Like, cause he's like, you give me every mistake you've ever made present, 
past, future, I'll give you eternal life. I'll give you peace that surpasses understanding. Like, I'll give you all those. I'm like, all right, great. So even with parenting, there's times or just in life where I'm like, my attitude stinks. Can I just trade you for yours? Like, I don't have time to get a new one. Yeah. Like, I don't like this meeting's about to happen. I'm about to walk in. We don't have time to do a vision quest for me to discover a new attitude. Can I trade you for yours? Can I just, can we trade? And he's like, yeah, go for it. And then I have a different attitude. And so like that for me has helped with parenting. It's helped with marriage. So yeah, so from things like fear gets a voice, not a vote to, okay, I'm going to trust that my kids are in God's hands and his hands are bigger and smarter and better and more creative than mine. Like, all right, like. Okay. And then again, like giving them time, like it took me years and years and years to learn these lessons and they're going to learn them too, but also giving them truth, like giving them practical, tactical truth. I read a study the other day in this book, Influence, and it sold 5 million copies. A PhD wrote it. It's brilliant. And there's a study that if a girl lets a guy buy a drink for her in the bar, she's more likely to feel she owes him something and engage in an activity she really doesn't want to do because of the, wow. it's the principle of a repers- I don't even say this word. Reciprocity. 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 Yes. That word kills me. So even just that single drink purchased, and that's not to like take away the idea that it could be drugged, like all the other reasons. Right. She now feels she owes him something because he did that thing. And so like I can then tell Ellie, hey, like I know this is gonna sound old fashioned. Buy your own drinks. Like be your own woman. Buy your own drinks. Like that's a practical, tactical thing that she can be like, oh, okay, like I can do that. Or like we get real tactical. And I don't think this is too much to share, but I'll tell them, hey, if a teenage boy ever tells you, oh, you're a prude, you're stuck up, you don't like, you're not wild, he's trying to get you to do something you don't want to do. He's trying to shame you. It's the reverse. He's trying to get you to go, oh, watch this. I'll totally do that. Or watch this. And like, so I'm going to, like, I'm trying to share as many tricks of the trade that I know. Mm -hmm. Like, these are dumb things. Don't fall for them. Cause like, I want to equip them. So that's part of my job as a parent is to be like, hey, if these three things happen, that is why. Or another one, a practical one, throw me under the bus. Throw me under the bus as a parent. Mm. So if you're at a party and you feel uncomfortable, be like, my parents are such jerks. They're so strict. I have to leave. Or like, oh, like we had a code phrase where they would text us. We knew that if they said the phrase real quick, they were in an uncomfortable situation. Hey, I have a question real quick. And we knew, okay, because the person might be reading the text. Yeah. So you go, that I look at all of life like that, where there's really high level practical things. Fear gets a voice, not a vote. But there's also really tactical things like, I'm going to tell you the things I know. And I'm going to... I'm going to guide you in this. Like Mm -hmm. even with college choices, the idea that we think an 18 year old is equipped to make a final college decision is insanity. They don't choose their healthcare plan. (laughs) Like they don't pay their own taxes really then. We don't even let them smoke anymore at 18. But we would go, it's a 200 grand decision, could really torpedo the rest of your life. You really like this color orange, so you make the decision. Like, no, <laughs> dude. Like, it ha- it's a dance. Like, mm. you can't push them too hard. It's all that stuff. But being an active role. And then the other thing, this is probably one of our biggest driving factors is that we're raising adults, not kids. Mm. Like, we're raising adults, not kids. And so one of the things we would say at our house a lot is, if you want a kind 16 year old, teach a six year old kindness and then give him 10 years to practice. Mm. And like that's, and whether if you're listening to this right now and you have a 16 year old and like he's a jerk, great. If you want a kind 26 year old, teach a 16 year old kindness and give him 10 years to practice. But doing that where it's like, okay, this is a hassle and she's five and she's fighting us on it, but we're going to work on this because this is 15. We're looking 10 years from now, this is 15. Like, and we're going to, and this is a hassle and this is, you know, this is hard. And, I think that's been helpful for us as parents. Mm. There's a lot of words. Oh, great words. So good. Yeah. And I was thinking as you were talking, John, I think, you know, my strong suspicion is that the reason people are so drawn to your writing and teaching is that it's so relatable. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, thanks. Experiencing that over and over with you again. Like, I think all this wisdom packaged in a lot of humor Mm -hmm. that makes it accessible and just, Grateful for your well, voice for a lot of Well, I'm in love with the tactical. I like when I get to share tactical, practical things. A listener can go, oh, yeah, I could try that tomorrow. Yes. Or, oh, yeah, that kid, like, that's something. Because I personally don't like when somebody says, hey, you should have an abundant mindset. I agree. But how? Yes. Like, how, what do I do with, like, yes. if you don't give me tactics, I end up just feeling shame. Like, right. I don't know. I agree, but I don't know how to do something with that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. How do I do that? And so that's where I try to go, okay. And the other thing is I'll never tell somebody to do something I haven't tried in my own life. 
And I think you can tell when you read a book that it's a good idea. It's a technically true idea, not a practically true idea. Mm. And you'll go like, if you want great kids, you should spend two hours every day with them. Da, 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 da. And you go, okay, nobody listening to this podcast right now is like, Dave and Sissy, I have 17 free hours every week. Like, that's my biggest issue. Can you fill them for me? That's not real. <laughs> that's not That's not so real. True. And so if you yeah. live in the real world, you get to help people in the real world. And so that's what I'm trying to do with my info. Love it. You're sure doing it. Yes, you are. I'm wearing glasses next episode. Like, this is this is <laughs> we, whack. You two and you go. I have it. readers. I have. Re- if you had been like, well, you'll read this, I would have been like, no problem. Your readers would have been welcomed here. Yeah, exactly, bring us next time. Exactly. I'm gonna. I'm we gonna. we love to end every episode with something fun and food related. We do talk yeah. a lot about parenting, but sure. also about food and. We have a two-part question. We understand you may have some strong feelings about the first Probably. part of this, okay? Yeah. So mm-hmm. part one is... going to be like queso or guacamole? Yes! How do yes. you know that? Man, I don't want to use the phrase profit, but I mean, come on. <laughs> we didn't talk about this before. I'm just... Yeah, queso, obviously. Guacamole didn't exist until like 1999. Like no one... <laughs> you didn't have it in the early 90s. Like no one had an avocado in 1982. <laughs> Like, so yeah, queso uh, all day. People will sometimes be like, is this good queso? And I always say what, like my friend Jeremy Cowart says, the best camera is the one you have with you. Mm-hmm. The best queso is the one I have with me. Yes, like very great. rarely am I like, oh no, this is terrible. So queso all day. That was easy. I all didn't right. even have to hear the question. I lo- <laughs> you knew it before I spoke yes. it. What's your favorite taco? That's part B. Oh, like taco place? Could be taco place or one you'd make at home. Oh, I don't make any tacos at home. Now I'm not skilled in it. Like, no, I never do hard shell. I don't know why people like hard shell tacos. It immediately disintegrates. If you ate a sandwich called fall apart, a first bite, you would be like, I don't want to soft shell for days. Like it's just not practical. The first <laughs> bite, it becomes taco salad. It does. They should call it pre-taco salad. <laughs> so for me, um, I love Torchies in Texas. Torchies mm, is a chain. Yes. Um, they're in Memphis, which anytime somebody goes to Memphis first and not Nashville, I'm furious. Yes. Like Ikea, dude, you're killing me. <laughs> and they told us for years, you're next to get an Ikea. Nashville's getting it. And then they stopped doing big box expansions for the internet and we lost our Ikea. Uh. So Torchies is allegedly coming here eventually. Um, obviously, we just know in and out just announced that they're coming. Yeah. So my hope is Torchies will come to Nashville. Do you have a favorite taco there? I always tweet out like, what's the off menu thing I should get? And then Twitter is like, oh, they have a oh. like crazy cow or like they, there's all this off menu stuff yes. that I just rely on real Texans. When somebody says, what's the best queso in Nashville or where's the best queso in Nashville? I say Texas. Uh, and people don't like that answer, but it's, that's the reality. It's very like, true. That's reality. Yeah. Like I think yes. there's some nice places we have here, but like Texas is just a different level yeah. and on so many things. Yes. I love that the really the first time you sat up in your chair was when we started talking about Mexican food. Yeah, I had that opinions. Was good. I yeah, had opinions. I'm glad. That's yeah. fun. I had opinions. Okay, John, tell folks where they could find all your content. Where's sure. the best place? Yeah, so my website's just acuff.me, so A C U F F dot M E. Um, your new playlist is sold anywhere books are sold. Soundtracks, same thing. I have a podcast called All It Takes is a Goal, where I interview people about the goals they're working on, which is super fun. And then acuff.me slash goals. I've got something called the Guaranteed Goals Community, where I walk people through a year of working on their goals. Wow. Because I really believe a goal is the fastest path between where you are today and where you want to be tomorrow. And 92% of all New Year's resolutions fail, according to the University of Scranton. And so the odds are stacked against you, but they don't have to be. So I love helping people finish their goals. That's awesome. Oh, John, so much good. Oh, Wise truth, practical, tactical, as you said, just so many things. I think people are going to be able to start immediately listening. Thank oh, thank you, you for that. For I appreciate that. Us. So grateful. So grateful. Super easy, guys. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Thank you. It's our joy to bring the experience and insight we gain through our work beyond the walls of the Daystar House. If you enjoyed this conversation, please share it with your friends. And don't forget to click the follow button in your favorite podcast app so you never miss an episode. To learn more about our parenting resources or to see if we're coming to a city near you, visit our website at RaisingBoysAndGirls.com. Join us next time for more help and hope as you continue your journey of raising boys and girls.